<clears throat> Testing one, two. This is a review of Report Alpha Tech 178408 Blank Bodies. Reporting Officer, Supervisor Kasten, myself, out of the Baltimore Recording Construct. Purpose of this review is to provide up to date information to agents in the field in order to increase efficacy in the performance of their duties. This will be the first of a monthly report distributed across our operational area with the intent of increasing general education regarding deviants of all kinds. The hope is that such a program will result in fewer casualties and a higher rate of successful interchange in encounters with all kinds of deviant life forms. All field agents, ensure to check your dead drop at some point after the first of each month in order to remain up to date on the BRC's intel. Try to give yourself some time to digest the information in each packet. Nobody likes a last minute crammer, especially when your life is on the line. Anyway, Report Alpha, TAC 178408, Blank Bodies. Blank bodies, or blood deviants, are colloquially referred to by many names, depending where you are in the world. But the most common label in modern parlance is almost certainly the word vampire. Vampires, as we know them, refer to themselves as kindred, and as such, they will be referred to as kindred for the remainder of this report. The higher-ups want you to get to know your enemy, and that means you have to start thinking like them, learning how to understand their perspective. And they hope that you bunch of layabouts calling them by their uh, so-called proper terminology will help with that. Now, these strange creatures were, for millennia, considered the purview of the supernatural, a monster fueled by the flames of hell itself. Recent research, however, has shown them to be very much creatures of the flesh, bound by the same laws of cause and effect that rule us all. Kindred do possess capabilities and benefits that are inherent to their condition, and these capabilities place them far beyond individual human beings. This obviously helps them fulfill their predatory nature and it comes with some interesting quirks, not the least of which is their immortality. We're going to examine some of these characteristics in detail and discuss some of the folklore behind them, as well as exploring possible scientific explanations for this phenomenon. Now, the first thing to understand when dealing with kindred is that there are very few universal rules. Folklore in general is useless, and yet for every kindred that we find, that can enter a home freely, we find another that can't enter without an invitation. This means that while in general folklore regarding vampires tends to stem from wild conjecture and local myth, some of it is couched in fact, which means that you as an agent cannot afford not to be well versed in such things. It is highly suggested, and if I have my way soon to be required, that all field agents spend some time educating themselves on the various aspects of vampire mythology from around the world. With that said, however, it is important to understand that observing a reaction in kindred in the presence of folkloric stimuli is extremely rare and should never be taken as a rule for the species as a whole. While some kindred do exhibit a reaction to garlic or roses or running water, these are exceptions, not the rule. The rest of this report will cover characteristics that have been confirmed to be shared by all kindred the world over, and hopefully that will provide you with a solid foundation to build off of when dealing with The Walking Dead. And that's probably the first thing that you need to understand. Kindred are indeed dead, or rather, undead. And yes, that is the scientific term that we have applied to deceased tissue somehow kept animate. While they seem to exhibit various degrees of undeath, each and every one of them is indeed clinically a corpse. 
In general, their hearts do not beat. Their body temperature remains low, affected only by the temperature of their local environment. They do not need to eat or breathe, and if shot, they do not exhibit significant loss of function. As mentioned, some kindred have variations to these traits, such as a slow heartbeat or the ability to consume food, though it has been confirmed in laboratory settings that this food must be regurgitated at a later time. Regardless of the degree of their condition, they are all dead, and what little signs of life you may be able to detect will be superficial at best. So, what is it that drives these creatures if it is not the processes inherent to life? The exact cause of the reanimation that we see in blood deviants, <clears throat> um, excuse me, in kindred, is still unknown, though we have been able to determine through experimentation that the cause is tied somehow to the kindred's blood. Now, that is blood with a capital B, because the fluid that flows within a kindred's veins has little in common with the stuff they drink from us. Indeed, it seems that consumed blood is somehow transformed into this other substance within a kindred's body. The blood drinkers themselves call this fluid that runs inside of them vitae, and it fuels almost every single process within their bodies. Kindred call upon vitae to open their eyes at night, to activate their muscles, to simulate intercourse, to do everything. Kindred even excrete vitae in place of other bodily fluids, such as tears or seminal fluid. We have even been able to confirm that vitae is the fuel for their seemingly supernatural powers. It somehow makes kindred stronger, faster, able to heal from grievous wounds that would be mortal in a normal human. Somehow, it even gives them their vaunted immortality. Vitae is able to accomplish these seemingly impossible feats because it is infused with primal energy. That raw stuff of creation that we long ago discovered suffused itself throughout the universe. How the Vitae came to be fused with such a powerful force is still a matter for debate and conjecture, and it is currently the subject of ongoing research that we are not going to discuss in this report. For now, it's only important for you to understand that the Vitae is everything to a kindred, and that employing the use of their abilities somehow uses up this precious fuel source, thus directly driving their thirst for blood. Kindred can process almost any kind of blood into Vitae, but it has been confirmed that they have a much easier time processing human blood. As a general rule, this blood must be fresh, though bagged blood has been shown to work, and a small subset of Kindred have been confirmed to be able to feed from the dead, though this seems to be a rare exception. I'm sure by now you all are wondering about their weaknesses. I can confirm that yes, Kindred are indeed deathly allergic to sunlight. The exact cause of this allergy is completely unknown and it has defied any attempt at understanding. We have only been able to confirm the sudden release of a burst of primal energy on a kindred's death. Whether this burst of energy comes from some sort of release within the kindred's own vitae, or whether it comes from some outside unknown source is unknown to us. We have only been able to confirm that even the strongest kindred will be able to die if exposed to sunlight for more than a few minutes. We also know that while their bodies can sustain physiological trauma that goes far beyond what is capable by a normal human, kindred can be harmed physically. Shoot one with a shotgun enough times, and it will fall into a condition known as torpor, a kind of healing hibernation that can sometimes last for millennia. If you can remove the head from a kindred, it is almost always a surefire way to dispatch one. It's worth noting that it's been observed in both laboratory and field conditions that a kindred will rapidly decay once it is killed. It's 
almost as if all the long years they have lived catch up all at once. Some kindred who are younger will simply turn into a rotting corpse, but the oldest kindred observed have collapsed into dust when slain, leaving behind little more than a blackened pile of twisted bones. And at last, we come to specifics. Those variables that I mentioned earlier that can make even two like kindred vastly different. While all kindred are immortal, have a thirst for blood, are stronger and faster than normal humans, we've also been able to identify different strains of blood de of kindred, and it seems that at least part of those oddities are passed down. Now, to call this process hereditary would be a mischaracterization of their reproduction, but we truly don't have a better word for it yet. Indeed, the kindred themselves seem to acknowledge this fact, calling their offspring childer or child. Each kindred, in order to reproduce, must first drain a human being to the point of death and then feed that human some of their own vitae. This will cause the human to undergo a metamorphosis, part of which includes physiological death. We do not yet fully understand how this process works. It has been observed that created childer are often much weaker than their parent, or sire, as the kindred know them. Indeed, it seems there is an immutable aspect of entropy somehow involved in the reproductive process, as some kindred can even be born with such diluted vitae that they only exhibit partial symptoms of the undead condition. Some of them are even still able to endure the sun. These hybrid creatures are known as thin bloods by other kindred, and it is our understanding that kindred in general will persecute these half-breeds. A bloodline, or clan as kindred call them, are a group of kindred which exhibit similar symptoms within their condition to other kindred sired from the same branch. In other words, all kindred from the same bloodline will exhibit the same traits. There are 13 main clans which dominate the kindred world, 13 families, if you will, that will make up the bulk of most kindred you will meet in the field. It is worth noting that there are nearly innumerable minor clans and bloodlines, but their population tends to stay low, so they do not rank as high when it comes to priority of study. We're only going to talk about the largest and most powerful clans in this report, but keep in mind that this is not a comprehensive list and it behooves any field agent worth their salt to continue to educate themselves on their own time. We will get to individual lessons on some of these more esoteric bloodlines in the future, but in the meantime, it's going to be on you to cover yourself. Now. Each of these 13 clans can t trace their origin, or at least they claim to be able to trace their origin, back to a mythical first founder, an individual kindred that started their bloodline potentially millennia ago. Now, a lot of these specific events are classified for you lot, but I can tell you that we have managed to confirm the existence of at least one of these ancient kindred. These mythical founders, they existed, and they are known as antediluvians by kindred, based on a claim that these creatures were created prior to the biblical flood. Yes, the flood was real, but that is, again, something for another lesson. Now, as I said, each clan claims to be able to trace their origin far back into prehistory to this single antediluvian. Every single kindred within a specific clan can trace their bloodline directly all the way back. The successive generations are known as just that in kindred circles. Generation. As mentioned before, the closer a kindred gets to their mythical founder, the stronger they become, and the more potent their undead condition. So, for example, a sixth generation kindred will be closer to the founder than an eleventh generation. And again, keep in mind, 
each successive transformation of a mortal dilutes the power within Vitae, meaning that that sixth generation will always be far more dangerous than a kindred of the eleventh generation. There is a general hierarchy of power that exists across all the clans based on these generations, where lower generations are generally placed into positions of leadership with these so-called elders lording over their weaker brethren. Now, the first of the clans that we are going to cover is also one of the most well entrenched. They seem to occupy a position of leadership even amongst the other clans, both in and out of an organization known as the Camarilla, which we will discuss in a future report. Now, this clan has managed to worm their way into key positions among politicians, economists, bankers, and other high society spots. Now, this clan is known as the Ventru, and they spring from an antediluvian of the same name, just spelled without the E. Now, we have records for this Ventru going all the way back to before Sumeria, but the fate of this being is unknown. Some interrogated subjects have suggested that he died millennia ago, while others seem to think he's still active somewhere in the world. Whatever the case, the Ventru's founder has not actually been involved in kindred affairs for some time, and if he is still alive, he remains hidden. The Ventru have a reputation among other kindred as able politicians and rich elite. They seem to have come from a strong base within the knightly orders of medieval Europe, and some interrogated Ventru subjects still seem to, at the very least, pay lip service to ideas of honor. Ventru have incredible powers of persuasion. Their bloodline seems to give them the ability to influence the minds of others, though the mechanics of this process are still under study. They also seem to be able to withstand a higher degree of physical trauma than other varieties of kindred, meaning that field agents must be prepared for a fight if they end up facing one directly. The second clan that we will mention today is Clan Toreador. The Toreador, like most of the clans, can be traced through the archaeological record back before Sumeria. Indeed, the archaeological division has discovered a mural that seems to have been painted by the Toreador's founder, a being known only as Ericle. This mural has been dated to older than 30,000 BCE. Now, the fate of Oracle is unknown, but the Toreador have been confirmed to have had a heavy presence among the Minoan civilization of ancient Greece. There are also scattered reports in the record of a being going by the name Ishtar, who may have inspired mythology behind the ancient deity of the same name. Toreador seem to have a deeply ingrained fascination of art, which may spring from the unusual quirk of their vitae. Toreador are preternaturally beautiful. They are, almost to a T, enthralling in a way that is difficult for normal humans and even other kindred to resist. Toreador congregate around places of culture and art, and we have rooted out many of them by backtracking local art donations. Now, the Toreador also exhibit preternational speed. They have been showcased in laboratory settings to have the ability to move so quickly that the human eye registers their movement almost as teleportation. We have even received field reports of Toreador running across the surface of water. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind, field agents, if you don't want to get caught unawares. The third clan that we are going to cover today is the Nosferatu, and yes, that name evokes the proper image of these vampires. Nosferatu are, down to the last individual, horribly disfigured and disformed. They exhibit truly inhuman characteristics, such as pointed ears and rat-like teeth, their bodies covered in terrible tumors, or their bones broken and fused back together at odd angles by the transformation into undead. 
It is unknown why this effect occurs when a Nosferatu is created, and all attempts to circumvent the disfigurement via means such as surgery or even molecular realignment have failed. We have no explanation as to why, but it seems the horrible visage of the Nosferatu is an immutable fact. This terrible and obviously inhuman nature has forced the Nosferatu as a whole to exist in the shadows of society. They move through the cracks, often making their lairs deep within sewers or forgotten caves, and they have mastered the art of remaining unseen. Indeed, another unique quirk of their vitae seems to be the ability to hide themselves with unnatural proficiency, remaining unseen in a well-lit room, or even being able to change their appearance. This effect has been shown to be some kind of mental influence in laboratory tests, and not the ability to affect outright invisibility or shape-shifting. This predisposition to a life in the darkness has made the Nosferatu incredible spies and information brokers, something that we have been able to confirm across multiple interrogations with various bloodlines. Encountering a Nosferatu in the field can be a boon for intelligence. So, we have a standing priority order to attempt capture of all encountered Nosferatu. Now, the Nosferatu's founder was a being named Abysmilliard, but this figure is so mysterious that we have been able to discover almost nothing about them. All we have been able to confirm is that, like the other antediluvians, Abysmilliard goes far back into the mists of our past, with his childer stalking us through history. The fourth clan we will mention today are known as the Bruja. The records on the Bruja founding are extremely confused, even when compared to the scant information we have on the other antediluvians. There is evidence to indicate that the Bruja may have sprung from one of two individuals, someone named Elias, and then another being known only as Troil. We have evidence to suggest that someone named Troil met their fate with the fall of Carthage, but this is yet to be confirmed. The archaeological division has even yet to discover any primary accounts of Elias, only an inscribed name from a single site in the Middle East. What we do know about the Bruja is that they have always been there, much like their brethren, but unlike the others, they have a predisposition for fomenting trouble. The Bruja have been shown in interrogation to suffer from severe anger management issues, with their nature devolving into an almost bestial state when pressed. Now, all kindred have been shown to sometimes lose control of themselves in a display of animal fury that is more appropriate to their true nature, but the Bruja, in particular, seem susceptible to these bouts of anger. Bruja exhibit the same supernatural speed as the Toreador, but they also exhibit incredible strength that seems beyond compare even among the other clans. Bruja have been confirmed through experimentation to be capable of feats of strength including, but not limited to, throwing a small car, ripping through a bank vault door, and tearing a human being in half. Ventru may be hard to kill, but it is exceedingly easy for a Bruja to kill you. Extreme caution and superior numbers are always suggested when engaging one. The fifth clan are known as the Gangrel. Now, if the Bruja struggle with their animalistic nature, the Gangrel embrace it. They are oftentimes found far away from the cities in the wild places of the world, and their vitae seems to provide them with the ability to command creatures such as wolves, birds, and insects. Additionally, they are confirmed shapeshifters, and they have the ability to grow frightening cloths or exhibit features such as slitted eyes, fur, and in some rare cases, even organs such as gills and fins. Gangrel tend to run in packs, and we have had issue with their numbers throughout the southwestern United States. 
these packs have taken to engaging our teams in the open, and they have caused a significant number of casualties. The Gangrel were founded by a mysterious figure known as Anoya. It is unknown whether Anoya was male or female, as there are records to indicate both, but it is known that unlike the other antediluvians mentioned thus far, she was active into comparatively modern times, confirmed by the archaeological record to have been present in ancient Sumeria, where the Gangrel seemed to have had a large presence that operated directly under Anoya's command. This hierarchy seems to have been dismantled or faded away in the modern day, as every Gangrel pack we have encountered has professed to be an independent entity that is in charge of itself. It should be noted that it is easy to confuse Gangrel with Theranthrope Deviants, a mistake which can cost you your life. Now, we will discuss Theranthrope Deviants in their own separate report, and we will discuss these differences more later, but for now, understand that if you run into something that can change into an animal, it could be a Gangrel. After the Gangrel, we have the Banu Hakim, known in the archaeological record as the Asimites. Banu Hakim means the sons of Hakim, and indeed, Hakim is the founder of this branch of kindred. They follow an extremely regimented, fanatical code that was laid down by their founder. This code has become intertwined with local religions over time, most especially Islam but the teachings of Hakim are far older than any religion. Captured Banu have been all too happy to inform us of their holy Hakim, whom many seem to worship as a kind of god. It seems that Hakim views the kindred condition as a curse, an evil stain upon the earth sent by a higher power to torment sinners. However, Hakim did not take this fact to mean that he himself should die, at least not right away. Instead, the founder of the Banu Hakim came to believe that he had also been cursed by a higher power, that it took a monster to truly slay a monster, and that it was his purpose, and the purpose of all of those of his blood, to bring judgment on their fellow kindred. Banu Hakim feed upon other vampires, but only ones they deem to be cruel or who have been proven to have mistreated humans. Many Banu believe that one day Hakim will return to reap all the kindred in the world, and that at the last he will even consume his own bloodline. Where Hakim has gone, or whether he even truly existed is still a mystery to us, but Banu seem driven by the unique characteristics of their affliction to feed on other kindred. We have confirmed in laboratory experiments that Banu have a hard time resisting the urge to consume Vitae. They truly find it physiologically difficult to resist feeding on other undead. They have also exhibited rituals and powers that share some characteristics with high science. Indeed, Many of their ceremonies are reminiscent of similar procedures which we have confirmed are in use by the Order of Hermes. How exactly Banu Vitae has this effect is unknown, with testing only able to confirm the release of primal energy stored within the fluid during these rituals. The seventh clan are known as the La Sombra, and the founder of this clan is shrouded in darkness, which is fitting for reasons which you will soon understand. The true name of this founder is unknown, their gender is unknown, but we have found records for this being dating back as far as 30,000 years ago, and they are mentioned in pottery shards from 2000 BCE as Lu Som Bihu. I hope I pronounced that right. 500 years later, we see them again in the archaeological record in the Hyksos, otherwise known as the Sea Peoples, which contributed to the Bronze Age age collapse. Except now, this founder is known as Laza Omri Baras. 
Today, they are simply known as La Sombra, and the name has been passed down to all of their offspring. The exact fate of La Sombra is unknown. Some interrogated subjects have claimed that La Sombra is long dead, while others have made outrageous, almost insane claims that La Sombra is now in control of Washington, D.C. Now, this has never been confirmed, and it kind of borders fringe conspiracy theorists, but what we do know is that La Sombra's childer compose themselves much like Ventru. It wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility to find them in the political realm. In many ways, they are the Ventru's mere opposite. They do make great politicians, but in general, they have drifted towards religion in terms of leadership. Where the Ventru see leadership as their right, La Sombra see it as something that they must take. Power and dominance are everything to the La Sombra, and religion suits their purposes better than any other sector of day-to-day -day life when it comes to oppressing their underlings utterly. We have confirmed that they have infiltrated deep into the Vatican, though our erstwhile allies in the Celestial Chorus continue to make claims to the contrary. It is unknown if the La Sombra's drive towards power is fueled by their vitae, as the Toreador's obsession with beauty seems to be, but it is known that their blood does give them the ability to command shadows. La Sombra have been shown in laboratory and field settings to have the ability to shape shadows with a thought, to see through shadows into faraway places, and even to step into darkness and somehow fold space, teleporting from one location to another. Now, this ability has necessitated special containment procedures for captured La Sombra individuals, but we will talk more about that in detail in the La Sombra report. Clan Malkavian is one of the more unique bloodlines that we have discovered, and a major force within the current kindred world. The unique quirk of their vitae seems to drive each member born of this clan into a deep, untreatable insanity. They can even project this insanity onto others, as well as exhibiting other mind control capabilities much like the Ventru. The Vitae of a Malkavian has also been shown to establish some sort of mental link to all other members of the clan. We have been able to confirm this connection in laboratory settings, and it's believed that Malkavians can use this network to communicate and possibly even to predict the future. It can be difficult to distinguish Malkavians from their brethren. Sometimes they exhibit overt signs of mental illness, but others are functional, even normal, their mental illness simmering just beneath the surface. The network they seem to share can only be detected by means that are far above our pay grade, but we know that this network goes back all the way to the Malkavian's founder, a being known as Malkav, whom legend seems to claim was a seer. Malkav seems to have been slain long ago, but many captured members of the Malkavian clan have been recorded during interrogations, raving as if they are speaking to a being they claim is Malkav. Indeed, some Malkavians have even said that Malkov used this so-called madness network to escape his own death, and that he is the cause for the hive mind that seems to exist between all Malkavians. Now, whether or not this is true is unknown, but we have been unable to dismiss it, and there are currently experiments underway which should be able to confirm or deny it for sure. The ninth clan that we will discuss today are known as Clan Zemitsi, or as it is apparently more appropriately pronounced, Shimishe. Now, where the Nosferatu are bestial and deformed, so too are the Shimishe. The difference between the two is that the Zemitsi often purposefully choose this deformity. 
Mzimitsi are a clan of shape changers. The specific quirk of their vitae has given them an ability that they have taken to call in flesh crafting or vicissitude. The special quirk gives them the power to change into almost any form, including the shape of inanimate objects or forms that completely defy human imagination. They've taken to use this power in order to transcend their humanity, and they oftentimes will take bestial or animalistic shapes that are unmistakably monstrous. We have been able to confirm through Zemitsi interrogation that this is a cultural aspect of the clan, with many Zemitsi viewing this monstrous transformation as a kind of ascension. Zemitsi can also use this power to create terrible flesh golems from corpses or living individuals, golems that are forced to do the Zemitsi's will. Indeed, the Zemitsi use this ability to create armies of these creatures and to dominate their region of the globe. Zemitsi, as the name might suggest, hail mostly from Romania and Eastern Europe, and we have confirmed that the Carpathians are a stronghold of theirs. They have always been closely linked to the nobility of the region and have a twisted culture of pseudo-honor and almost ritualistic politeness. Zemitsi seem to be one of the clans which as a whole do have issue entering buildings when uninvited, though the exact cause of this quirk remains relatively unknown. It's worth noting that Zemitsi who delve deeply into their shape changing become actively contagious in ways that other kindred do not, with even a touch enough to infect any other biological life form with a terrible disease which will render the infected little more than a corrupted, unrecognizable mutant. This disease has been dubbed by the Zemitsi as Asaku, but we have frighteningly little information on its nature. The Zemitsi founder is also shrouded in mystery. We don't know their true name, or indeed whether or not they are still active in the world, though some captured Zemitsi subjects have made the claim that their founder is still alive. They seem to hold the idea of their founder to a much higher degree of reverence than is seen in other clans. The tenth clan we will mention is known as Clan Ravnos. Ravnos was founded by a being that we have been able to trace back to the Indus Valley civilization. It seems that this creature ruled over the valley openly under the name Zappa Thasura. Indeed, the protection of this monster seems to be why the Indus Valley peoples did not require massive armed militaries, though this fact would lead to their downfall whenever Zapathasura eventually abandoned his throne. The descendants of Zapathasura would remain in the region and eventually they would become integrated into the Indian subcontinent as a whole, specifically among the Romani peoples. The clan shows an affinity for animals that are not dissimilar from the gangrel, but they also have the ability to create illusions that are indistinguishable from reality by all but the most sensitive equipment. The Ravnos would spread across the world with the Romani, but in the modern day they are all but extinct. Again, while the details are classified, I can say that the antediluvian founder of the Ravnos clan has been successfully slain by our forces, and that the Ravnos have become endangered in the wake of this incident. We expect the Ravnos to go extinct within the next century. It is also worth noting that since the death of the Ravnos antediluvian, we have been able to confirm a change in the Ravnos condition. They seem to be unable to remain in one place for longer than a week, and any Ravnos which has been forced to remain stationary will spontaneously begin to exhibit damage similar to that caused by sunlight. Now, the cause of this is classified, but I am, at least at this time, able to tell you that there are several ideas as to why. Clan Tremere comes next, and they rank among 
the more unusual of the kindred groups. Unlike the others, they do not spring from the mists of ancient history. Tremere was in fact once a hermetic house, a member of the superstitious Tomard organization that we know as the Order of Hermes. Tremere was the head of his household, and he was always obsessed with life-extending reality deviation. This took the form of an elixir of life for many centuries, but records seem to indicate that the rise of the Order of Reason, the precursor to our own organization, undercut the power of this elixir. In desperation, Tremere began to hunt down kindred, experimenting on them in order to discover the secret of their immortality. This research would eventually lead Tremere to the resting place of one of the antediluvians, a being known as Saulot. Now, we'll discuss Saulot and his direct descendants in a separate report. For now, please understand that Tremere would consume Saulot's vitae down to the last drop thus assuming his power in a process known as Diablerie, which we will also discuss more in detail in a future lesson. This Diablerie would allow Tremere to found his own clan, but it would also steal his ability to manipulate reality. Tremere would attempt to compensate for this sudden hobbling by experimenting with his own vitae, creating a simulacrum of the earlier levels of hermetic teaching and giving him the ability to alter reality on a local level much the same as the Banu Hakim. The Tremere refer to this art as blood sorcery. They are a secretive clan and we have been unable to ascertain much though we did manage to strike a severe blow against them with the destruction of their headquarters in Vienna. It is believed that Tremere himself was slain during this assault, and his clan has remained divided and leaderless ever since. The twelfth clan that we are going to speak about has reorganized themselves in the modern era, and now goes by the moniker of the Ministry. However, in times past, they called themselves the Followers of Set, and claimed to be the offspring of a deity of the same name. Whether or not Set existed is unknown, but the Setites hold to his veneration as a matter of religious principle. We have had mixed results questioning Setites in interrogation settings, with several interrogators going mad while attempting to pry information from the subjects. The Setites seem able to use their vitae to discern secrets, even the most private intimate moments of another person's life. Some Setites have made the claim that it is Set himself who whispers these secrets to them in their blood, but unfortunately we have been unable to confirm this. Little is known about the internal structure of the followers of Set, as they are an extremely secretive organization whose few public faces are shrouded behind layers of obfuscation. We know that they adhere to their beliefs with a fanaticism that would cause the Banu Hakim to blush, but the true nature of these beliefs, other than a general veneration of Set, is unknown. We have confirmed that many of the other clans have an innate distrust of Setites, and that they are viewed within the kindred world as purveyors of chaos, anarchy, and duplicity. Current operations have a focus on rooting out Setites, with standing orders to take as many of them as possible alive. Keep that in mind when you're out in the field. The final clan that we're going to discuss today is another new one, one which we are almost positive was only born after the year 1999. This is Clan Hakata. Clan Hakata is actually a union between several smaller bloodlines, bloodlines which we'll cover in detail on their own in separate reports. Some of the individual sects which came together in order to form the Hikata are the Giovanni, the Cappadocians, the Nagaraja, and the Samadhi. 
each one of these bloodlines is rare, with their populations remaining quite low on their own. With the death of the Ravnos Antediluvian and the destruction of the Tremere Chantry in Vienna, many of the smaller bloodlines realized they did not have a chance against us, and they came together for mutual strength and protection. The organization that would result would become Clan Hakata. We know frighteningly little of how the Hakata organize themselves now that they have come together under a single banner. Intelligence gathering efforts are still ongoing, but we have been able to confirm that Hakata have begun to exhibit new common symptoms within their vitae. We have no idea how this evolution has occurred, but we know it has occurred. It's possible that some kind of ritual was performed in order to bind the disparate bloodlines together into something new, but this is simply conjecture on my part. What we do know is that the Hakata have exhibited the ability to interact with Jmards, the beings that we colloquially refer to as ghosts or spirits. Their vitae has been shown to allow them to command these interdimensional creatures, to feed off their energy, even to step through the dimensional barrier into the realm that the Hakata refer to as the Shadowlands, or the realm of the dead that these particular Jmards seem to project themselves from. This power is not to be underestimated, as it can be used to escape from capture, to spy upon our operatives, or to slip past our defenses. You must always be on guard against these things, and while the Hakata still remain generally small in terms of population when compared to the other clans, you cannot exclude them from in-the-field tactical analysis. Alright, that's going to bring us to the end of this lecture, guys. I know uh, we're pushing a long one on this one, and believe me, this was only a quick and dirty introduction to Kindred, aka Blood Deviants. You should now be able to list the general characteristics and capabilities of most Kindred, the basic means of combating them, as well as the 13 largest clans operating within the Kindred world. Now, keep in mind that this lesson is intended to supplement your in-the-field operations with greater knowledge. So, try to study it a few times to make sure you absorb the information. You'll be getting another lesson next month. Again, check your dead drops, and until then, stay safe out there. Remember, we're fighting for the true reality. This will close Report Alpha TAC 178408 Blank Bodies, Reporting Officer, Supervisor Kasten, Baltimore Recording Construct, signing off.